How did we make money in the Philippines and how did we get to where we are today? Back in 2007, um, me and my wife decided that we're going to work on um, making a sustainable income in the Philippines so that we could travel later on, but also um, we could help my in-laws um, so that they're, they've got a stable retirement income as well. First thing we did is I started blogging early on, um, 2008, February 2008. Um, along with that, I mean, at that time, I was only making like one to two dollars a month, not a great amount. But at the same time, I was going to hop to the UK. First trip, we built a piggery, got first batch, of, two batches of pigs, made a profit, not a great profit, uh, but it paid for the, the actual building and the pigs. So we didn't make a lot of money, but at the same time, it was a good experience. And I would say, if you've got um, space for your own pigs and you're you're like um, you're good quality meat. Do it yourself. You'd say save uh, at least thirty percent on what you pay in other people to do your meat for you. But the other important bit is you get much better quality by doing it yourself. On top of that, because we had this structure of the foundations, when I went away the next time, we'd actually um, constructed an internet cafe in that same space. Um, by now, the the blog's making anywhere between fifty and a hundred dollars a month. Uh, doesn't sound a lot, but we didn't need a lot back then. Our rent was only three and a half thousand. I think uh, our electric bill was less than a thousand. We had no big expenses. The internet calf didn't make big money, but it ticked over. What you have is I'll be sitting there blogging. 10, 12 people in the internet calf, all paying to play on the computers, making a little bit of income every day, and ticks over. And, and now the profit, buy another PC, buy another PC, buy another PC, and that's how it ticked over for a while. Um, it got to the point where people started doing these peso peso machines, which are coin slot computer and operating systems. They're in arcade type box, people just put coins in. I bought one and I think I built another three. And what I did is I took the internet calf out and the, took several of these units that we built and put them at the front of the building and people would just come along. Now those may seem bizarre why you would downsize the number of PCs, but the fact was the biggest cost on the internet car, uh, cafe is the running costs. The cost of the internet, uh, the the cooling, the cost of the lighting, um, with the coin slot machines, they just pile the money in, sit outside, there's nobody stood, sat there having to watch them, um, they just tick over and just empty the cash every night. The the blogging's about a hundred dollars every every month now, um, and you've got that coming in. We also set up a loan company, which I invested, I can't remember how much money, I think about £6,000 in, and that's still ticking over today. Uh, we got the, at the side of the internet calf, we'd started a store, because my mother-in-law started with two, I think it was two or three beer beer crates and a few bottles of uh, fizzy pop. We built that up a bit, I, I bought a chest freezer, chilled beer, and people would travel around the area because not many people had freezers. This store built up, not huge amounts of profit, but it was it was something that my mother-in-law was now self-sufficient after retiring from work. Um, so and my father-in-law took over the the loan company and dealt with that. So my in-laws are looking after themselves. And we are getting money in from the coin slots. We've got money coming in from the internet. Not making great deals of cash, but everybody's self-sufficient. That was the whole point of the thing. I then went back to the UK again for another project. We built the uh, internet calf. We built another apartment on top of it. Um, now that apartment, when I went back that time, um, got rented out. 
we got um, a guy called Kento, a friend of mine, uh, was Japanese American. He lived in there for a year, <coughs> and we lived downstairs because we moved from the other apartment. Um, there was a reason why we moved out. I think there were there were some relatives coming or something, and they wanted access to it. So we thought perfect time to relocate and save another three and a half thousand pesos a month. So we took the bottom one upstairs. Kento lived. Coin slots paid the electric bill and the internet. Uh, rent come in. That that then started to become a fund for other projects. Um, the internet money from Google paid for the uh, food and stuff like that. And we're ticking over. Everything's just ticking over, ticking over, ticking over. Um, and then I went to a man. I had a project come up in the map. Now the Amman project it was an interesting one um, because we, my daughter had been diagnosed with autism which sort of jump started a lot of the change um, because what happened was when I looked at the Philippines originally it's like most people do, they just see the Philippines but my concerns were always about family. Um, Different ways, you know, we decided we're going to, once things were set up in the Philippines, we were going to travel. But now it actually changed where I wanted to make sure that my kids would be financially stable forever. Um, so I headed off to a man, I headed off to the Middle East. Now, I do survey surveys, I do um, FM contracts, facilities management contracts. Um, can't really discuss what I was doing there, but it was for an oil, oil company. <coughs> but the on the back of it, I could see there was a market for outsourcing. Now the reason I say this is because I was out there and I had so much paperwork that I needed doing because I had, I had six guys collecting data for me. But I had guys from Pakistan, Canada, America, uh, UK, and they all write differently. They all abbreviate differently. Half the time, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, so I had to, I, I mean, I spent time simplifying it, but you still end up with a backlog of data because we haven't pushed forward on the contract. So although things are improving, you've got all this paperwork trail that needs to be corrected over a period of time. And you don't have the time to do it. So all this stuff come back um, to the Philippines with me. Um, and it's also, I thought, there should be people doing this in Oman. But there wasn't. Because a lot of these contracts, people cut, cut the costs everywhere. Cut, 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 cut. And one of the ones that always get sacrificed are administrators. Yet, we needed one. <coughs> so, anyway, I returned back to the Philippines. My office had been built above what was the, or what still is today, the Sari Sari store. And in there, I had my little desk and not a lot else. I then got two people to sit there. They would take paperwork home, translate all the documents into an Excel sheet, bring all the paperwork um, and the Excel sheets back to me. I would then reinterpret the Excel sheets and correct all the mistakes in the Excel sheets. And that was how our outsourcing started. We made about £2,000 on that. From that £2,000, um, I took five of the PCs from the internet calf and I learned how to program a dialer. Now the programming the dialer, I wouldn't advise anybody to do it unless you're completely technical um, because if you do it wrong, and many call centers in the Philippines still do it wrong because I know they do it wrong because I do the same calling as they do um, but my running costs are at least half of theirs because they're running the dialer wrong. Um, but anyway, we started with five people. And the funny thing is, because we're not on the main road, people are like, is this real? Is this a real call center? So we struggled to get people to come out there. Um, so we hired some local people, trained some of them up, and we got uh, one call center agent that was available um, who actually had a lot of call center experience and got her to train some of the other guys. And while this is going on, I had other projects with website design. Um, I was doing—I mean, I think the one I was doing at the moment at that time was for a Spanish school. 
um, for for teaching Spanish in Salamanca, I think Salam. Yeah, I can't remember where the school is now. But anyway, so I was busy with that, and I was basically letting it evolve. Because what we've got is we've got projects coming in from Australia. Uh, we had a merchant account because a friend of ours also runs another call center nearby. And we then moved into solar. Uh, the solar stuff, we started off at $35, uh, $35 a lead. And when I looked at it, I thought, this isn't even worth bothering with. Because the problem you got is call centers say, don't say no to some of this stuff. And you, they're just losing money. So that's where it started. But at the same time, when we started hitting the solar, our quality started improving. Because we had a product that the guys actually got. They, it's not that they understood solar, they understood how to sell it. So we're doing like $35, $45 a lead, and we're making a profit. Not a big profit. Um, at that time, probably making about $1,000 a week profit. Um, but we've gone from five people to 10. And out of those original five, we'd actually funded another five PCs and we were growing weekly. We we're buying another PC every week. And what you were finding is we were quite lucky there'd been another fire there'd been a fire at another call center. So we've got two quality controllers that are time served and they're both people that I love working for us because they're really good and although they're quite hard on the guys on getting the quality up, you have to be. But with that, it went from 10 um, to my office was full. There was 14, I think 14 PCs, and I had to move my desk into my apartment because there was no space for it. I then had the problem of we rented the house over the road. We had 10 PCs in the bottom, and then we put seven in the front room. And we were getting, um, I think in total, we had 40 PCs. We'd actually run out of space to put any more computers. Um, that's how quickly it was growing and this is within months and our profit had gone up but one of the key factors was is I moved away from dealing with brokers now the reason I say this to people this is why people don't know they may think I'm a bit offensive on brokers because brokers are a bit of a parasite it's alright if they're only taking 10-15% but most of the ones in the call center I've come across so far I want 50 and sometimes even more um, because they're in, they were India, Pakistani based, they worked in a call center, they've stole their client list or whatever they've done out there, and then they turn around and you'll see them. Um, there was a guy that we come across who's pretending to be American and everything else, and he was actually in uh, Bangalore, absolute rogue. Um, I can grumble and complain about it. Um, he owes me money, but at the end of the day, it's just one of those things. That's the industry. But we then progressed that we bought the building next door. Um, that cost us 1.2 million. At the same time, it needed full renovation. It'd been empty for over 12 years. And I don't. I think I spent at least half a million in there um, renovating the building to up to what I was happy with. I then spent money on new PCs over there, and we ended up with full flown, uh, full flown call center. Along with that is the several apartments along there as well. So that's where we are today. Um, we've got um, on the one side the store, two apartments, uh, plus my office. On the other side, we've got call center plus two downstairs offices. And we're up renovating the upstairs at the moment for a three bedroom apartment. Not bad from something that started with a piggery. And that's why I say, you know, where people say, oh, you're so negative on the Philippines. Well, we've done all right in the Philippines. It's not us that have suffered, it's the people that have been around. Um, people contact me because I write blogs. People contact me because they know I'm pretty blunt. You know, if they've got a problem, they know I'm quite blunt in dealing with it. Um, it's just me. It's just the way I am. I'm not negative. I just say it as it is. And for us, Philippines has been good. Um, we're in Spain now. But 
part of being in Spain was the typhoon event. Uh, because the typhoon high end uh, wiped out our internet. It, but prior to that, we got hit with the earthquake that knocked half the computers over. Uh, only broke one monitor. But it was disruptive because I couldn't, I didn't want the guys working while it was going on. I also had somebody disappear with about four thousand uh, dollars. So I had all this stuff going on at the same time. Typhoon high end hit, and what I did is I sit there, sat there, and thought, "We've been lucky. We've been so lucky because this year everything's just gone right. We've we've now got uh, a large building with more apartments, cool center, everything." You know, it could take somebody 10 years to get that. North of us, people lost everything. Um, so what I did is I sat there and I worked out. Uh, video froze there. Um, I sat there and I worked out how much... Uh, money I needed for three months and gave the rest away. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, we couldn't work, the internet was down, and I wasn't expecting it to come straight back up anytime soon because we're not in the city. Without uh, the power went down as well for a bit and a few days, but not a, not a major issue for us. But, so, what we did is we then had a trip up to the supermarkets emptied the shelves of water, uh, matches, bread, um, what else? Medical supplies, whatever we could get with everything I had over that, you know, because basically I put three thousand, uh, three three months money aside, and then spent the rest on aid stuff. Uh, we beg, beg and borrowed a vehicle, filled it up with all the stuff, and drove it to the north of Cebu and we gave all the stuff away now some people might think you're mad for giving away stuff and only having three months money to live on but what happened was I looked at the state of people and how much they'd lost the inefficiencies of the government the inefficiencies of international aid and decided to intervene myself because I'm local um, Philippines would be very good to me and like I said, although I say there's a lot of bad things in the Philippines, it's been good to us. Uh, I just like to warn people about some of the stuff that does go bad. Um, for example, I know a guy uh, this week, uh, his ex-partner was actually murdered um, by her roommates in Baguio. You might have seen it in the media, where they smashed her um, scarlet and beat her with metal bars shoved her in a suitcase and threw her under the sink. Um, not normal things, but they're very bloody normal in the Philippines, unfortunately. Um, and that was it. So I went back to the UK and built our cash flow back up. Put about uh, £16,000 in the bank and brought my family to Spain. Bring them to Spain was part of the, the legacy of I promised to do it back in 2007. But also the kids are coming up to school age and I wanted them to get a European education. The well, European education and European, European passports, they're pretty much guaranteed a good, good life. They're already multilingual, um, which puts them ahead of a lot of people already. Um, but giving them the EU passports, the world's their oyster and that's basically what's what I did so that's how we made our money do I regret anything don't regret anything I've done in the Philippines don't regret it. even the bad stuff is being part of the roller coaster ride if you don't have bad stuff you don't know when that when you've got the good times so the fact I'm saying just let it roll and enjoy it all right thanks for watching